So we're gonna get started now. You can follow along by signing up at getrecon.xyz. It's completely free and you can build open source repos for free. Hopefully this works. We're gonna go in the public repos. We're gonna paste the URL. We check the foundry.toml. The foundry.toml has no customization. It's the normal out and that should be it for us. So we just start the job and we see that it was added to your ABI data. That's because Recon has uh, uh, ABI caching. So if we already built a repo, we, you don't have to wait. So that's something convenient. Uh, and it's also a bit of alpha. If you build a repo and nobody else, uh, and it takes a while, it means nobody else built it. Whereas if you uh, build it and it's instantaneous, it means somebody else already tried building it. And uh, uh, that's what uh, the UI is gonna look like. So we have uh, about 40 minutes to write. So uh, there are many ways in which you can approach invariant testing from a uh, hacker or white hat perspective. And the, one of the fundamental aspects is that we could isolate one of the functionalities. So just because you have all of these buttons, right? You can just press buttons. That doesn't mean that you should. It doesn't mean that you need uh, all of the code, right? We could look at something like the interest rate model, which actually is a pretty interesting thing. So we could do something like this, where we basically just build for our interest rate and we see that we have set values and we have transfer ownership. And so that's actually something that uh, um, could be uh, yielding of uh, uh, bugs. And so, uh, but the long story short is we're going to identify a target and then we're going to come up with an action plan in terms of finding it. So before I commit to this, I'm going to go back here and it's time for us to go to the uh, code base and do some scouting. So let's go on the SRC. So we see this V3 vault, revert land vault for token lending, but we're using Uniswap V3 LP positions as collateral. So we would expect to see Uni V3. We most likely will expect to see some aspects here. We see loan information, token ID, that, etc. We see convert to assets. So the first second you see something like that, you will think about ER646 to six. And so whenever you think about ER646 to six, you just want to think about these critic, uh, critic properties repo where a lot of properties are already written for year six for six to six so this is actually uh not gonna yield any you know incredible exploit you're not gonna find something unique but uh, you definitely have a lot of low-hanging fruits in the uh, year six for six property tests uh, because you could find some rounding errors some implementation errors so you could definitely find something that could get you started. And so that's an example of um, a low achievable goal we could achieve today would simply be to run, for example, a test on convert to shares and perhaps see if we're able to find some sort of a arbitrage or some sort of a denial of service, uh, which will be uh, found simply by testing whether we get a revert or whether we get some error so those are a couple of ideas uh that i get from simply looking at this i feel like just from experience the fact that we see a if else and a couple extra logic here indicates that uh this is actually a pretty decent target for fuzzing uh simply because we could apply some you know a ballpark idea and see whether this works um so that's an example so i'll uh, leave it as a my possible target possible target and let's uh, but let's spend a couple extra minutes just seeing a couple extra ideas a little bit more alpha for you guys so we have an oracle we actually have a v3 oracle so that's really interesting and the first thing i think about when i think of an oracle that uses uniswap is whether it can be manipulated uh i have uh i mean the the answer to manipulation on oracles is that it's just a matter of price it's just a matter of how much it costs uh that said uh, something you would uh, potentially experiment through invariant testing will be uh, determining the cost of the manipulation or whether the manipulation is possible given specific aspects. We see here that TWAP seconds is basically, a, I mean, 
do I even need to tell you what I just saw? But uh, we definitely see some interesting aspects here on uh, the cooled lead to potential exploits. Uh, although you will most likely want to see the configuration of the, um, the TWAP to determine whether it uh, could actually allow for that. Uh, something else that is pretty dumb that you could also look into. It's dumb because uh, it's simple, but it can actually still yield high severity findings will simply be fuzzing the get pool because if there's an error, and as far as I know, in the integration test, there's a different uh, init code hash. So you would actually be able, given specific chains, to actually find a possible uh, uh, configuration mistake, although it most likely will be a mistake on us in understanding the code more so than an actual bug. And then we can look at our interest rate model here. Uh, and I, I feel like uh, when it comes to these, um, it's definitely high, uh, a high value area to explore simply because you will be able to um, utilization rate over cash plus debt. It's simply because it's super short, but it also has a big impact because obviously this uh, uh, determines the, uh, the rest of the behavior of some of the systems. So um, I guess, um, uh, I could do some boring uh, year six for six stuff and basically just check if it compiles or something. Uh, but let's actually do the interest rate model. And uh, uh, obviously I'm gonna stop uh, fairly early, so don't expect uh, miracles, but let's just set it up, get a couple of ideas and see whether we can find something. So I'm gonna go back to recon on the interest, interest rate model. I have it selected. I go to the results page so that uh, all of the foundry scaffolding is already set up. Uh, I could look at some of these variables, but we'll, uh, we'll just set them up later. So I'm gonna download the files. And I need to grab Visual Studio Code. I'm gonna go in the test folder. Since uh, we don't have a lot of time, we don't wanna recompile all of this stuff. So let's just delete 100% of the tests just for convenience in compilation. Drop the recon folder here and then rename it to recon. We're gonna need to grab our Medusa file, drop it here. And then we have to pass an argument, which I honestly always forget, which is, uh, what is it? Uh, foundry compile all. Uh, Antonio, if you can paste it in the chat, if I made a mistake, please send me the uh, check. And uh, then the next thing we will have to do will be install our little helper called Chimera. We just copy it and we install it with dash dash no commit so that we don't have to uh, update our git. And then I copy the remappings and drop them on the foundry repo. And we only have chimeras. So actually let's keep uh, for just TD as well. And maybe there's a remappings here. So since there's a remapping.txt, I actually have to uh, drop the remappings in the txt file. And I think that's gonna be it. So let's see if we are in a good spot by running forge build. Blah, blah, blah. Compilation error because of the audit tag happens quite often. It is what it is. And then we have these before after variables that we didn't set. This is a known bug of our builder. So let's just delete them for now. We don't need them. And our next goal is simply to get to compilation. So that's what we're gonna do. We have our interest rate model. I'm gonna close everything else. And I'm gonna go to the interest rate model Constructor is going to be base rate per year, multiplier rate, etc., etc. So this is where if you just randomize these values, you are going to make a massive mistake because uh, we're going to just find some random finding about a um, uh, potentially incorrect setup. So the best course of action will be to go back to the um, revert land code base and to actually inspect some of the tests and hopefully we'll be able to find a setting that could work for us. So let's see this interest rate mode. And we see that it's created with these values. 
because it's created with these values, then um, I feel like uh, we, we, it makes perfect sense to use them. We, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Let's start with the same result. I bet Q96, uh, we probably need these. So let's actually grab these three constants for Q32, Q96 and years in seconds. That way, if we end up needing them, we have them and uh, that's gonna be good. So at this point, let's just forge build. And our only goal is to get to compilation. We don't have any particular opinion, except the fact that we have a fairly small surface area. And as soon as we have compilation, we're gonna explore the surface area, come up with some uh, properties, and then code these properties in order to find possible uh, problems with them. So 50% uh, of our work is simply understanding the system. So we're coding to learn. And the other 50% is actually uh, potentially finding uh, problems with it. So um, um, let's go with this interest rate model. And let's, uh, I would like to open it up to everybody. Why don't you guys just throw me some ideas about what properties we could test? What would be an interesting property that we could test here that uh, could yield some interesting result? Anybody? Give me an idea on the function get utilization rate and the function get rates per second. What could be an idea? What could we, what could we find here that uh, could be interesting? Somebody, somebody so unmuted? Is there, yeah, so just an idea. Uh, is there a particular direction that is which is constantly increased towards? Or because uh, when I when I look through the code base, uh, the last time I checked it, uh, there's no lane and borrow right here. But last time I checked it on the both the both inside when you query when you, uh, when you query the global lane limit in the victory vote, you get uh, it returns landing and depth land share rate, landing rate and borrow and borrow rate. Um, when I examine this to it, they always increase or like, like or they remain the same or always increase. I don't know if that's valid, that's, if a similar case going on here. In should case. always increase. Well, I'm going yeah, to start, uh, I mean, I will start with something more simple. I think <laughs> what I will start with is that okay. we have this comment right here. By the way, it's really hard to hear you. So. Let me just, uh, I guess, take over. But um, we see here this comment right here, the utilization rate can go between zero and Q96. So this is an example of a false property. I'm gonna actually show it to you what happens. We're gonna break this and it's gonna be broken in 10 seconds, obviously. But this is an example of us actually being forced to integrate the rest of the system before we can look just at this property. So we'll, uh, we'll explore this in a moment. The next one is get rates per second x96, which is basically checking for the utilization rate given the cash and the debt. And then it's going to basically give us a supply rate, uh, which is equal to utilization rate times borrow rate divided by Q96. So I guess uh, supply rate will basically be the uh, yield that you get for providing liquidity, whereas borrow rate is the cost that a borrower pays in uh, borrowing. So a property that we could have there will be that the uh, borrow rate always has to be greater than the supply rate, because otherwise, if the supply rate is greater, then the protocol is insolvent. Uh, and this is actually, funny enough, this is something that has happened in, um, and I don't know if we could have prevented it for this, but uh, uh, this was called wild credit. Funny how it's not even here anymore while credit wrecked, but this was one of the early, early Coderina reports, 2021 maybe. While credit, August 2021 and November 16. And there was this uh, generic finding about uh, um, uh, this, this problem with the rate, but uh, nobody used the fuzzer, so nobody was able to find it. So at this point, we have two ideas, very simple ideas. And then lastly, we have set values, which could be interesting. And uh, I can definitely see 
something interesting there as well, where perhaps we will be able to find something uh, there as well if we uh, simply uh, think about it uh, long enough. So at this point, I have two ideas and I got a couple of functions. So I'm going to go back to the setup and I'm going to commit. I'm going to commit as uh, uh, the starting commit. So if we uh, start, it compiles, it works. We're in a good spot. So we want to go to our target functions. We want to look at them a bit. We have a renounce ownership. We don't care. So we're going to delete it. We have our set values and then we have our two view functions. So in order to grab the view functions, I guess we'll just have to uh, re-get them. We can go to before and after tracker. We need to grab utilization rate, uh, which I guess is being filtered out because it has parameters. So we'll just do the good old quick and dirty setup of grabbing this. And then we'll grab the rates per second like so. And so we basically will have a function, get utilization rate, blah, 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 public. And we'll uh, have to decide what to check on these functions. But for now, we'll just uh, set it up like so. And uh, at this point, we want to uh, assert our first test, which is that get utilization rate is always less than Q96. So the way we'll uh, uh, write this is very simple. I, I see this uh, transfer ownership. We don't need it either. So we'll just delete it. And so at this point, we'll do interest rate model dot get utilization rate. So let me, I'm in the wrong function. Get utilization rate, cash, and debt. And so that's going to be our current utilization. Obviously, this is a stateless uh, library, so it's a bit, uh, it's going to get a bit uh, nuanced in actually implementing this. But at the end of the day, if we want to verify that we never are above Q96, we will simply do an assertion that, uh, which we can do from the true library from uh, Chimera, and we will simply assert that current utilization is less than or equal to, uh, we said it was Q96 utilization above limit and then perhaps uh, even though it's a uint so this will actually never be broken uh, we will say that it's, it's supposed to be greater than or equal to zero so we will say that it's below limit although obviously this will never be broken whereas we have expectation that this one will be broken very quickly so let's uh, forge build to get uh, uh, feedback and see whether we have written something that compiles It does, so at this point, I'm just gonna Medusa fuzz. This is our first line of feedback from uh, the fuzzer. We wanna see that it runs, we wanna see that it's coverage, and to be quite honest, I would also expect it to actually break the property in the first second, simply because you can just provide a value uh, here, uh, or actually, you know, I think it should never uh, beat this property, so we should actually expect it to never break it. Because this is, uh, if cash is zero and that is non-zero, then this will always be fine. And then the only case of a revert will be uh, if cash, uh, I think it's going to be fine. Let's see. We have coverage set to zero. That indicates that nothing is happening. But coverage set to five actually indicates that something is happening. And so at this point, we're fuzzing our code. We have uh, literally two functions being called and then a third function that is empty. So we will be reviewing our coverage shortly. We don't expect, uh, as you can see, we have 45,000 calls per second. So we don't expect uh, the fuzzer to need that much time to get uh, uh, to meaningful coverage. And uh, we may also never achieve any line of additional coverage simply because we're fuzzing something too small. So what I typically will do is I will stop it, go to the Medusa folder, open up the coverage report via reveal in Finder. And we have to go for the file called target functions. And we can see that we have 100% coverage, so it's being called. However, it's important noticing that uh, this being called doesn't mean that this is not reverting. 
uh, it simply means that uh, these lines are being called. So instead, on this line, on line 19, the fact that line 18 is green means that it's been called, and the fact that line 19 is green means that line 18 was called and it did not revert. Otherwise, this line will be red while this line will be green. So that indicates to us that we are uh, fuzzing the interest rate model. So let's search for interest rate model dot so and see what the coverage looks like. We can see that we're not checking these values. Could be interesting to check. Uh, I'm not, uh, I guess I'm not sure if we have a non view editing function. It doesn't seem like the case. So this is effectively a stateless uh, contract. And then we can see that we're not fuzzing the get rates per second x96. So uh, I'm going to open it up uh, to the audience. What else could we check here before? Because obviously, uh, there's stuff that we're not checking here. So what else could we check on this utilization rate uh, function? What other test could we apply? Any guess? There's a lot of tests we could apply, obviously, but what is a simple test uh, that we could apply to see if this function is breaking in some way or reverting in some way? What is a classic revert check we could have? It's not a trick question. It's actually a really simple question. Let's see. Very simple. What, how does a function revert? How does a library revert? Could run into zero. Okay, that's fair. So division by zero, another one. I'll wait. Uh, come on, overflow. There you go. Yeah, so this function can revert, right? So something that uh, we're doing here is we're simply checking that none of the values are greater than Q96. However, we could check that for some value, this function reverts. And so the revert could be interesting because if you put it in the context of the entire code base, then maybe there exists some value of cash and debt that caused the overflow that is realistic in the code base that could be interesting for you to explore. So let's do that. We could uh, just copy our test and call it get utilization rate, blah, 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 overflow. And then we will remove our uh, checks here. And instead, we will simply do a try, boom, catch, boom. And then we will assert false here. So t false function reverted. And obviously, we're not checking for overflow. To check for overflow will take a bit longer. But at the same time, we're now checking whether there exists some value for which the function reverts. And so uh, this could, again, indicate uh, edge cases, or it could indicate values that the protocol cannot support simply due to precision loss, uh, or rather to uh, size of the inputs. And then to actually check for overflow, I believe you need to do a check for panic 17. Um, and maybe we'll uh, follow up, but there you go. Took us uh, an instant to get uh, a uh, revert. And so the um, extremely naive 10 second solution to determine whether this is a valid uh, finding or not is instead to use uh, this. So blah, 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 there's a test summary. So let me see if I do, I just wanna do some swag thing, but basically we get our broken lines. And as you know, with Recon you automatically get the critic to foundry debugging. So that's where we're gonna paste our test. I'm just gonna run Medusa one more time because I want it to generate me a log and hopefully I can just paste it in the get recon tools Medusa so that we can basically have the introduce our newest uh, tool for debugging called, or basically just a scraper. So let's uh, do that. We get our broken test. few more runs, I'm gonna command K, I'm gonna stop it. It stops here, I copy the entire log, and let's see if it works. There you go, Do, don't even need to type. And so now I can just, I guess I'll call it uh, recon, so that I have a test called overflow blah 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 recon. And so now I can just run the test through forge test match test recon VVV. And we will get a um, revert. 
So obviously once we get the revert, we can debug it and we can determine why the revert happened. So obviously this is a uh, basic example because uh, most reverts um, are fine, most reverts are safe. And so it may be interesting to check uh, uh, why uh, you're getting the revert. And obviously we're getting an overflow here because we have insane numbers. So something that could be interesting will be to limit these to something like uint 128. And so if you do that, uh, I guess it's the wrong test, this one. Uh, but if you do that, uh, you, you may be able to find a scenario in which uh, the overflow, uh, or x11, which is 17, um, the overflow actually uh, is meaningful, right? So this could be an interesting experiment because perhaps uh, you can find some value for a specific token that has a bunch of decimals, something like safe moon, something like, uh, uh, I guess safe one is the last I remember, but uh, that, that may actually overflow. So now you have an interesting result. So at this point, let's do a quick fuzz of get rates per second. So we go back to the interest rate mo model and then we get get rates per second. So we we'll simply call it and get those two results in a very similar fashion to what we just did. Cash in that, and then we receive a couple of UN256, uh, which we got here. So I'll just grab these. Borrow rate and supply rate. So this is potentially where we're gonna have an exploit, but to be quite honest, if we uh, end up finding this, I mean, obviously we're gonna send it, so credit us, but at the same time, it's, it's gonna be a real, pretty dorky to find. But basically, we know, as we said, that the borrow rate must always be greater than the supply rate otherwise the protocol is insolvent so that's what we will assert we will assert that the borrow rate maybe let's say strictly greater so maybe we actually find an edge case could be interesting because uh, obviously why would you uh, supply if 100% uh, of the uh, like if there's no profit compared to borrowing so let's say strictly greater and i do believe we have a gt helper but i'm so used to using this one i'll uh, stick with it so Let's go ahead and run it and see if we end up finding uh, the uh, the bug, I guess, the, you know, $17 bug. So we have a issue here with the compilation for some reason. It's interesting how this wasn't an issue before. So we'll just comment this for now. And that's effectively our flow. And uh, something that uh, we're gonna sh show in a moment is that this may not necessarily be a real exploit as in you end up not finding a um, full uh, you know, end to end problem. And by the way, one of the properties uh, above this one will flash as wrong anyway. Uh, so this is actually a common bug you'll get with Medusa. Since we changed uh, some functions, um, uh, because we changed the signature here, we basically mess up the corpus. So we just have to delete the folder. It's uh, a normal bug, a known bug by Medusa. If you change the function signatures of your handlers, you have to delete and restart. Uh, you, we will eventually write uh, a way to uh, fix that, but uh, it's, not, it's gonna take months. So just delete the folder and restart. And then again, we will expect this quick overflow bug here to be broken. And then if we see sticker GT, let's run to the code arena, <laughs> code arena submission form for uh, you know the, the low hanging fruit number uh, 1000. So there we go. We actually broke it in literally one second. So apparently, but maybe it's just wrong by the way. So it could be uh, completely wrong. Oh no, there you go. Medusa found the edge case. He found a zero zero, right? That's actually, that's the most fun uh, outcome out of all is that he broke it instantly, but he broke, li he broke it uh, in a way that doesn't really make uh, a difference to us because he broke it by asserting that if you have an insane amount of cash and low amount of debt, then both of those values are going to be zero. So maybe that's meaningful. Maybe that could be a precondition of something 
that we would want to find. Something that we could do if we want to be even more degenerate would be to say that borrow rate, or actually we don't want to assert this, we want to require it so that uh, Medusa will stop every time it finds uh, these uh, zero scenarios. So because we want this to be strictly greater, then basically we just want to have supply rate greater than zero. And by definition, borrow rate must be greater as well. So that we basically we skip uh, all zero cases. And so once uh, you, I guess, have the intuition that uh, it's going to take a while, something that we can do will be to go on the git ignore and get rid of uh, Medusa. So slash Medusa slash critic export. And so we got rid of those. We will basically store our progress on our handlers. And then we basically just go on GitHub and upload a repo. I'll call it uh, revert demo. We can then upload the repo through our, our usual command. I guess uh, origin is uh, already there, so I need to RM it first, and then I'm gonna upload to my own origin. And we know our code runs because we tested it. So at this point, I got my revert demo main that works with Medusa. So I just grab the URL, I go on Recon Pro on my jobs on Medusa, and I just paste it here and I run it. And uh, that's basically, um, you know, we started the casino roulette. Now we just have to be lucky. And in an hour, we'll come back and see the result. Uh, or I guess I'll see the result. You'll have to run it locally if you followed along. And uh, if we found a non-zero scenario, uh, uh, basically we may have found either a precursor or an actual uh, bug. And then I guess to shield the last aspect of Recon, uh, if I wanted to send this to the development team immediately, I could just share the job, you know, if you wanna copy the URL or something. Uh, but basically that way we can share it publicly so that as soon as we have the POC, we can just send this as part of our POC and uh, this is proof that it actually works. So that's uh, the demonstration for uh, today. Uh, do you guys have any quick question or a quick uh, request? I can uh, do another 10 minutes uh, of coding if you guys have a specific uh, question. Uh, but that said, that's really the entire flow. You read the code, you find some ideas, you use the helpers to get to there, and then uh, what tends to happen is that the tool is actually almost smarter than you where uh, it finds a way to break your own rule uh, before you can um, polish it. And so you have to polish the rule to make sure that it actually helps you find a real bug more so than a uh, fake uh, bug. And uh, this is something that you can integrate in your uh, um, uh, process for security. And so if you always do something like this, first of all, you will have written the POC because Medusa generates the POC and then you just make it a little bit better. Uh, but second of all, uh, you also have done a level of scrutiny and a level of analysis that very few people actually do simply because you basically tried all of the combinations, which is very difficult to do in your own head. And it's a lot easier to do with this type of tooling. Great questions. So in terms of the uh, first question we got is, I noticed you use T instead of assert for writing the assertion. Is that a Medusa thing? The uh, T is a helper from Chimera. And uh, it's basically asserting true with a message. And the reason why we want that is simply because that way in our Medusa log, so I don't think we have a log here, but in the log you'll see um, the events uh, uh, from the message. So this will actually be put as an event. So that way it's a bit easier to debug the uh, result instead of having an assert that will just tell you that it results in false and 
uh, good luck uh, with the information. Uh, in terms of before, after, I very rarely use before, after for hacks and quick fuzzing. Uh, I will call what we did, I wouldn't even call it invariant testing. This is basically glorified fuzzing. It's uh, just fuzzing with a cannon instead of fuzzing with foundry. So uh, they are very similar. The main uh, difference is that you're using Medusa um, uh, instead of uh, uh, Foundry. And so the other aspect I will mention um, is that uh, um, you would add the before after if you started to track stateful operation and stateful uh, aspects of the system. So if I needed to check, let's say, that the debt never decreases or that uh, after a liquidation, the value of all the system uh, is maintained, then that's when I will consider having a before after. Uh, although I could also just write it as a stateful test. So uh, what I found is that most of the times until you have a more complex setup, you never need the before after. You'll use the before after only once you have a, a complex setup and you need to actually track things that uh, are most more than just atomic. Uh, so where atomic means, you know, this is A, this is B. If all you do is check A and B, you are very, very unlikely to use uh, before after. You're not going to need them that much. Whereas when you have A and, le and then you have C and you have B and you have C and you have to check, let's say, the liquidation of multiple CDPs or multiple states, then that's when you'll start to add those uh, because otherwise you're going to uh, load all of your handlers with all of that extra data and it can become difficult to manage and difficult to write. Uh, and so... Uh, I think that's where it becomes a preference, though, more so than actual usage. So keep writing and you'll eventually uh, uh, do it. Uh, in terms of pro, uh, I'll talk to Antonio, but uh, we will give uh, um, a few trials. So if you're interested in a trial, uh, uh, definitely reach out to us via chat and maybe we'll do a raffle. Or maybe we'll give you a trial of the staging version and you basically send us bugs and we send you a free version of the trial. So that's what we are looking uh, to do. We have uh, a staging site. Uh, perhaps let's start uh, the trial uh, or I guess the, the question today. Send us uh, the best bug you can find on staging.garrecon.xyz and we'll do a raffle for you to be able to use uh, uh, a month of free pro. So you can run your fuzzing in the cloud uh, on us. So go on staging.garrecon.xyz and send us your best bug and we'll raffle you. We will upload to YouTube. You guys have an amazing one uh, and uh, best of luck in the arena. Uh, that said, hopefully we convinced you that this will help you get started quickly, explore ideas quickly, and then over time, it's gonna also help you to actually find bugs. So hopefully in a few months, my, my reports are out, you'll see what I've done with Recon. And hopefully in a few months, when your reports are out, we'll also see what you guys have achieved with Recon. So you guys have an amazing weekend. We'll be next week and uh, uh, we'll drop the staging URL for you guys to check uh, right now. Send us all the bugs and we'll raffle in a free month of pro. You guys have an amazing one. See you next week.